Well, I am very excited to be here tonight at the Regent Theater in downtown LA with Mark, the voice of the chameleons. Thank you so much, Mark, for being with us here tonight. Very welcome. Very welcome indeed. And right before we went on, we were actually talking a little bit about um, the current tour, which has been uh, just very eventful. And tonight, here we are at the Regent, a venue that you weren't necessarily planning on playing. You were slated to play over at the Echo. And uh, because of the demand uh, from fans and tickets sold out, uh, they basically, we needed a larger venue and hence we're here at the beautiful Regent. Yes. Uh, what was that like to actually have the opportunity to play a bigger venue than you anticipated? I didn't actually know the venue because um, I've played quite a few venues in uh, around um, Los Angeles area, but I'd never played here. Yeah. Um, so I didn't quite, I didn't know it, uh, but I was, uh, they were sending me photographs of the, the, the guys yeah. that we were touring with. Um, Softkill, they were sending me photographs of the venue and saying, hey, this is like a lot better than last night, which is, uh, you know, it was a little bit of a dive last night. So, and it's always, you know, it's always pleasing to know you're going to a bigger room uh, for t because of yeah. ticket demand. It's much better than, than saying, no, we're going to a smaller one because we haven't sold any. Definitely. So, uh, and especially here we are on a Tuesday night. It's not Friday or Saturday. So that's a pretty good sign. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. And um, I mean, the it's always they've always been very very generous here. Uh, our, I mean, we've always had a really great audience in Los Angeles for everything that I've done, not just chameleons. When I came through with Sons of God, it was one of the highlights. Um, it always has been, so um, I'm really happy. Mark, in addition to being a, a wonderful musician, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, your authorship, having penned uh, View from a Hill, kind of an autobiographical account of your days, well, various days uh, back in the day, and also just musings on different things. Um, we've had the pleasure of uh, interviewing other artists, such as Hugh Cornwall of The Stranglers, and we talked about his... Yeah, big, big respect. I met him at South by Southwest some years ago. He was a smashing fellow. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And, you know, through the years, especially when I'm interviewing musicians who've um, been authors, I always love talking to them about that process. Mm -hmm. And so for you in working on your book, I mean, what was that like? What, did it take a long time? Was it just kind of free form and it came easily for you to recount? It, it did come easily yeah. um, initially <coughs> because all it was was um, in about 1988, 89, I got my first Mac. And I didn't really know what I wanted it for because the guy, because it was all very different back then. You, yeah. you bought them from corporate centers. Yeah. Um, uh, Apple centers were very corporate and yeah. business. Yeah. And um, he said, well, what do you want to use it for? And I, I don't know. You had your floppy, your five inch floppy there. One one. Yeah, 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 it was a floppy yeah. drive. It was um, a whopping four megabytes of RAM. Oh, okay. <laughs> and a whopping 20 megabyte hard drive. Wow. Um, but no, I wanted to learn how to use it. And, and obviously word processing was like, you know, a big, one of the big things with with the with the early Macs. So I started writing and uh, and I just kept it up. It was something I kept going back to. And then in about '94, I let it slip. Someone asked me that same question: I, yeah. do, Have you ever thought about writing a book about it all? And I just well, as it happened, I did. St I've started one. Yeah. And when that got out, then I got a lot of feedback from people saying, "Oh, please finish the book." Okay. But it wasn't until my father was diagnosed. He was diagnosed terminally ill. And uh, that's when I got my, you know, I got my ass in gear and said, right, I want this out, bef you know, while there's, while he's still around to yeah. put a copy in his hands. Wow. So that's uh, what, and that's why there's a still the type proofing on the original hardback copy is oh, wow. lousy because I was in a rush, gotcha. so uh, to get it, you know. Well, that's a beautiful, touching story, though. I mean, I, you know, I've, and I know that the book was actually reissued. Um, it was in hard copy. It came out in paperback. And I read just in April of this year, there was kind of a, a, a definitive edition, a definitive one more version of it that yeah, came out. there's a definitive second edition okay. um, that's just been, and all of that, uh, it's been smoothed out a lot. Um, it reads a lot better. Uh, it's got a discography with it, which wow. I th okay. you know could have been a bit more comprehensive, certainly okay. between you and me. But yeah. I didn't do that. You know, yeah. um, I w it was something that I was planning to do, and I just could not devote the time because, you know, I um, publishing the hardback copy was um, such a massive thing yeah. for me. Uh, it took so much of my energy and time. Yeah. Um, I kept kind of putting it off, and then these people came in. The publisher came in and said, "Well, we'd like to do it," and we sat down and. Um, they went ahead and did it, and now they've worked out a U.S. distribution for that. In fact, I'm doing a signing in Phoenix oh. tomorrow, if I can get there fast enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't even, you know, you mentioned, you know, of course, um, kind of the theme of mortality with your own father passing, and yes. a lot of artists that we've interviewed talk about the existential theme of mortality and how oftentimes that's kind of a driving force. I think even Freud, when we talked to Hugh Cornwell, actually, we talked about um, uh, Eros and Thanatos and all of these kind of psychological things that... Um, you know, force us to be creative. And uh, a lot of fans, when they're talking about the chameleons, really appreciate kind of 
kind of the philosophical or existential themes that are present in the chameleon's work and your solo work, right. um, themes of existence, non-existence. Um, for you, and you know, sadly, most most of your fans know about you know back in the later '80s, your manager uh, Tony's passing, right. and kind of what a, a key Unofficial. kind of uh, unofficial manager, but deeply influential gentleman, and yeah. and how that kind of impacted or in some respects maybe destabilized at the time That's things. Yes, well, yeah, he was a very stabilizing uh, factor at a time when it was really. It had, it had started, to our relationship, personal relationship within the group, especially between me and Dave, would, was fragmenting. Yeah. Um, but he held that in check. You know, it didn't matter when uh, Tony was around. He kind of had that stabilizing kind of, uh, th um, he had that, you know, he, he would um, crystallize uh, everybody's affection for what we were doing. And, yeah. um, and that's what, and I think the, fra the you know, the, the, the fragmentations were probably as a result of us not really having someone in that role. That we respected and and and, and looked up to, and, and you were all no, like Tony Skinkis, who's who's with me now. Yeah. He was there from the beginning, but he'd stepped out by that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, he'd had kind of he'd, he'd done five years of it or something, and yeah. Yeah. you know he'd stepped out of it. So we didn't have that that stabilizing element until until Tony Fletcher turned up. You know, yeah. so and his impact. But I mean, as a human being, just yeah. as a as a as a quality of human being, yeah. more than what he could, you know, what he did for us. Yeah was uh he's just was a, an amazing guy and yeah. and a wonderful wonderful man yeah. who had the respect of the entire industry yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and not to minimize you know things but i mean th you and the rest of the band members at the time were all pretty young gents you yeah. know out there touring dealing with money dealing with the stressors of fame oh, and ego <laughs> and yeah yeah there we go cocaine <laughs> and strip no, um but but so to have a uh, an older you know uh, stabilizing force i mean i don't want to be cliche and call him a father figure right. but 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 a real positive kind of element that kept the band together and kept things balanced. That that sounds like a really important dynamic it back was, then. And, he, and he, he didn't really know who we were. He, it was a, the, there was a company that wanted to manage us who uh -huh. also ended up publishing us okay. called Kennedy Street Enterprises. And Tony was an employee. Uh -huh. And they'd send him in to kind of organize things yeah. for them, yeah. whether it was concerts at Wembley or whatever, whatever it was. Uh -huh. And they just said, get down to the Ritz in Manchester uh, we've got this band now, Chameleons, and we want you to go down, see if they need anything, go and look after them. And he, he turned up. And we, now, he didn't know who we were. We didn't obviously know who he was, but yeah. he impressed us within five minutes because we were, we were trying to hang a backdrop. And oh. um, our guy was having a real struggle, and he came and he just said, you know, what do you need? And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Spoonhead, he was his name Spoonhead, he said, w we could really do with a black drape. Um, and within five minutes, he was uh, he had he was on the phone to the Apollo Theater across town, oh, wow. and had one brought within ten minutes. Wow. He w they they came running in with it. Here I go, Tony, and up it went. And we just went, whoa, that's just not used to that. And you nodded your head and said, this this is our guy right here, maybe, yeah. Right. So then he saw the show, was blown away by the show because wow. he didn't know what to expect, yeah. and he decided to jump on a plane to Paris because we had an engagement in Paris the next day, oh, a television oh. thing and a gig, yeah. and he just jumped on the plane. Yeah. Uh, and came and, and organized us to the studio and did all of that. And then, uh, as an encore, jumped on the lights because there was no lighting guy that night. So he said, right, I'll do it, and he jumped on there. And that was wow. the start of a, an amazing relationship, wow. you know. Wow. Um, and we wanted him to be our official manager, but he was compromised because he worked for this company that wanted to manage us. Gotcha. And, uh, but at the end, he, he had did decide to do that. He, he um, was ready to, to do yeah, that, right? Yeah, after the American yeah. tour, we did yeah. the Strange Times tour in 87, yeah. and he came in and he said, right, I'm gonna do it. Um, this is gonna be the plan. And we were like, oh, you know, really excited. And yeah. it um, and it involved, it was a big thing, because we, we were gonna be coming here for like a couple of years. We just put Strange Times out with Geffen Records, yeah. and the follow-up to Strange Times was going to be made here in America. Uh -huh. And we were gonna make it here, demo it there, do all the songs, we had the songs, some of them came out as a, um, a demo uh, of a Tony Fletcher Watson Water EP. Okay. Um, we were gonna do that album in America and then we were gonna play again yeah. and play again. Wow. And, and tr because we felt that, um, I mean at the time, you know, uh, um, Europe, mainland Europe was okay, England was always a kind of a struggle except for London and Manchester. Mm -hmm. Everywhere else were like, we were struggling, but over here, <coughs> we were embraced wholeheartedly. Wow. You know, we had like New York Times pra raving about Strange Times, and we had like the, our con our gigs were 
our audiences were fantastic, you that's know. That's so interesting. I mean, not to interrupt too much, Mark, but that's so interesting because I think most fans think of you guys, I mean, if, if you could put the chameleons back then in a sort of socio-political historical context, a lot of people think about Manchester and the UK post-punk scene and yeah. Joy Division and, you know, the Smiths and Stone Roses. So that's so fascinating to hear that actually here in the States uh, there was actually more... Um, yeah. Well, Manchester obviously yeah. was uh, um, always, you know, very, very strong for us, and our homecoming gigs were always amazing yeah. uh, in terms of reaction. But um, no, I mean, yeah, we, 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 we Manchester were, Matt, we could be there, but we weren't really part of it because we, we, you know, we didn't fraternize. We didn't, you know, the only time we went into, the only time I ever went to Manchester is if I was going to the record shops to yeah. get records or playing. You know, I'll go to see a band, but yeah. I didn't. I lived in the in the in the sticks. Okay. You know, so I mean. So it wasn't this kind of. Uh, there wasn't this. I'm sorry to b burst the bubble of of music historians out there, but there wasn't really this this uh, musical camaraderie. Uh, there certainly was the Manchester and later the Madchester scene and all of that, yeah, of but um, but not necessarily in a, a real f a familial type relationship amongst some of the bands no, in there. Not, no, no, not from us because they didn't. They really didn't know who we were or where the we came from gotcha. excuse me gotcha. they they were like who is this i mean we yeah. played local band night at the hacienda uh -huh. right you know it was us and who we did we play with foreign press i think it was yeah uh, you know it was a season of it i mean we played and then the week after i think the smiths played and then james played the week after, you know it was, but um we put like about we put over 900 people in on a you know a, a, a week day on a work day work night uh -huh. um and they like they couldn't like what who the, what what you, you came know? out of left field there. Yeah. We did, yeah, yeah, because like you know, uh, we had our audience wasn't p wasn't part of that Manchester thing. Okay. They were like our our audience were kind of disenfranchised from all of that. Yeah. They couldn't afford to go to the Hacienda. Yeah. They'd pay to go to the Hacienda to see us. But that's the only reason. You know, most of them, a lot, some of them did, but most of them wouldn't go there. Because I couldn't afford it. Wow. So you, you actually, your fans were more representing kind of the proletariat, if Absolutely. you will, uh, of that scene at yeah, the time. We, we, our lot, were, we, they were more likely to, you know, um, buy a quarter of hash than put money in to get in the electric meter. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? They were like, they were, you know, um, very uh, grounded. You know, and then they weren't well. They weren't affluent. Hacienda was quite an affluent thing. You had to have, you had, you know, you had to have a decent job to <laughs> to pay for a night out at the Hacienda. It was expensive. Uh, I didn't have to pay to get in, though. I have to say, thank you, Peter. <laughs> Peter Hook, there always oh. looked after me. Yeah, Hook, the yeah, man. Yes. I wanted to talk to you about um, the Peel sessions that you yeah. guys did. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the, I'm, I'm fascinated by John Peel. We just uh, witnessed uh, not too long ago his uh, the 10 year anniversary of his untimely passing, yeah. and I've had the pleasure of interviewing a lot of musicians particularly folks from the UK, uh, Deb Gouge from My Bloody Valentine, uh, Mark Gardner from Ride. A lot of people actually cite uh, the Chameleons as a huge influence on Ride. Really? And yeah, yeah, so awesome. Mark didn't say that, but we will uh, track him down and confirm that. No, We've interviewed well, I, him I, twice. You know, I wouldn't expect him to, I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't really. I mean, I'm very well uh, my influence <laughs> up until actually starting the band, because I know that, you know, a lot of serious bands, that's a, they, they embrace the, they'll embrace their influences to the point where they're actually starting to write good stuff. But yeah. when they get to that point, they actually want to push those influences down and do something original. So it's kind of irritating when, yeah. uh, you know, it can be irritating when somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you're obviously influenced by such and yeah. such a band. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you're going, like, well, you know, A, you know, they might not be. It might yeah. just be yeah. in the perception of the hero. But secondly, it's like you're working hard, right? It's not sound like anybody else. So if, they, if those influences are evident, then you're not doing a very right. good job of it. You're so I don't expect him to. Yeah. I don't expect him to. But I wanted, seriously wanted to talk about John Peel, of course, yeah, the Chameleons yeah. Peel sessions to which uh, we actually have the vinyl release here, the remasters here tonight. Very excited about that. But um, a lot of people credit John Peel's exposure of the Chameleons as really helping, you know, just. Oh, it's absolutely pivotal. Yeah. I mean, um, we just wanted to get on his program. Yeah. We weren't thinking like, well, step one, get on the program, <laughs> step two. Yeah. We didn't like think that way. We were fans of the show. Um, and we listened to it like you know Monday to Thursday. It went out um, until midnight. We and we just we it, it was a ritual, you know. Uh, we'd catch his show, have a few beers, and then make sure we got back for the pit for Peel. Um, and uh, that's all we wanted to do was to get on the show. So that was the aim. And we having done that, I didn't really you know that was it. We did it. Wow, you know we got on the show. We were on the show. And we got to listen to you know they didn't give us tapes. We couldn't. They wouldn't do that. We had to actually listen to the show and hear our tracks come out of the radio, which was fine, you know. But then 
the ver you know what we didn't expect we didn't expect him to kind of hype the session which is what he did he, yeah. the night before the session went out he's going oh, i've got a great band here you know you, yeah. you don't want to miss this band and then um <clears throat> and then on the night he was waxing lyrical so the day after the session yeah. our lives completely changed wow. the next day wow. our lives changed the phone started ringing yeah. you know and we had uh labels and publishers and managers wow. all clamoring to, and no one to talk to because we didn't have any management we didn't even think about that you know we didn't we were you know and in terms of our development we were kind of retarded a little bit because we we'd, we'd not um dave and reg had done a lot of playing yeah. in uh, in their earlier thing they'd played a lot of pubs and things like that you know like pub circuits and um i hadn't played had i think i'd only played about three or four gigs in my life wow. and um so we hadn't i hadn't we hadn't learned that I hadn't really learned to be a singer because I, I didn't intend to be. Yeah. I was the bass player. Yeah. And then the, it was Reg and Dave who said, no, we want you to be the singer. Because they'd seen me in this little punk thing that I was doing, that, you know. Yeah. So they'd seen that and they went, well, well, that's what we want. And I'm like, oh, oh. Because I was only doing that because I couldn't find a singer, yeah. right? Yeah. So they went, oh, you want to do that? So I hadn't really learned that very well. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> we, so we were kind of thrown in at the, very, you know, at the deep end. Uh, because uh, we suddenly we're, we're supporting you too at Sheffield Lyceum yeah, yeah. and shit like that, and we had, you know, we had to learn on the fly. Yeah. You know, we're doing like we're supporting chart bands like Altered Images had records in the charts. We did yeah. that, or so, uh, yeah, I mean, and but we didn't have a clue. Wow. You know, we had to learn it all. So I can imagine just the back, the, the pressure, the anxiety, or, or was there not? It just came naturally. You guys just, just put it together. It. Yeah, we okay. just went with it. We didn't take it seriously. Okay. Because uh, they hype you, don't they? You know, first yeah. of all, it's like you know. We, we, we were, I remember sitting there in Virgin offices and uh, the, one of the guys who picked us up, Danny Goodwin, was on the phone to a, a major label and he's going, you know, yeah, we've got the best thing since you two. We've had to go way north to see them. And we and David going, oh, they sound good, don't they? I wonder who that is. And he was talking about us. And we're like, you know, we didn't realize we didn't make that connection. And then I'm, I'm going like, okay, now, now that, because our first question, we got published first, publisher, and our first question was, well, we want a record label. We want a record deal. And there's, oh, we'll get you that, that's yeah. easy. You know, oh, okay then. So, you know, we didn't know how it worked. We knew nothing about it and we had no manager. So it was in a kind of worse position uh, to kind of deal with the consequences of like such hype coming in the wake yeah. of, of, of John. And John didn't, you know, John was just being John. I mean, he, yeah. that's how he felt about the music and he said it, you know what I mean? But the consequences of that were like, you know, we were always catching up with ourselves because yeah. it was, yeah. you know, we, we were at sea, really. So the John Peel stamp of approval gave basically overnight, uh, for lack of a better term, almost legitimacy. To I mean, in terms of like pr the presence that you guys were trying to establish. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because we'd focused on the songwriting. That's what we decided to do. That's why we hadn't played many gigs. And we got together six months and said, like, well, we're not going to be playing all these like pubs and clubs and stuff. People that don't want to listen to us. We'll just lock ourselves away and focus on the writing. And that's what we did. Wow, wow. You know. So when with the writing got us noticed uh, by John initially and you know by others eventually and uh, then we had to learn you know I had to learn they could play but uh, you know I hadn't even I don't even play that year you know yeah, a lot of people we've talked to that that have done Peel sessions talked about you know that John Peel wasn't always really involved in the process no, you know it, it was you know, he had an engineer da 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 right. um, but but you guys had the pleasure of actually meeting John and interacting with I him though right I met, well I met yeah. him I met him twice yeah. um, I met him uh, when we sat outside the BBC to wait for him because okay. he'd written us a letter on a on a demo that didn't even have drums on it yeah. and he said like this sounds promising if you do a studio take. So we sold everything that we didn't wasn't crucial to uh, making music, you know, all our extra amps, extra mics, old uh, bits, and I just kept the bare necessities. I went into Cargo Studios in Rochdale, uh, recorded a studio demo, got on the train, went down, sat outside the BBC till he came and gave him, uh, and showed him the letter. So we met him that day. That's so funny. There's a lot of stories about, like Billy Bragg has a story about getting, being getting falafel or something and hanging out outside the office there for John, and that's so fascinating. Right. And well, up till that point. We always thought it was the obvious thing to do, right? Yeah. Up to that point, no one had thought of doing that. Mm -hmm. They'd like they'd come up with these gimmicks to get his attention, oh, right? Yeah. You know, you know. Like uh, a banner or something well, somebody or something. blew him. Somebody, somebody sent him a blow up, uh, a blow up Kenny Dalglish effigy because oh, he, yeah. he was a Liverpool fan and he okay. and he, okay. his favourite player was Kenny. Dalglish. Things like that. They they'd okay. figure it, you know. But they really didn't need to because when the second time I met him, I was in his office, yeah. and in a corner of his office. 
there was a box and it came up to my chest full of cassettes, full yeah, to the brick of cassettes in. that came in all the time. And I'm like looking at that and I'm thinking, I, and I said, I was, was in that box, wasn't it? And he went, yep, pulled it out of the box. Oh, wow. He said, um, he said, that'll take me a while. He says, but I will, I, will get, I will listen to at least the first couple of minutes of every single tape in that box. So whether they got his, you know, and if, he, and if he's impressed with what he hears, yeah. he responds. Yeah, yeah. So they didn't really need to go to all that kind of trouble. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't was, John was definitely a man of substance versus style, I guess we could say that in that respect. Thing, yeah. You know, it, that was, he loved discovering yeah. stuff and he loved to be the first to play it. Yeah. And that was a kind of little thing that I know that he definitely had with Dave Jensen, who was also on the station. Yeah. Um, they had, you had this, like, they, you know, John liked the fact that he would get stuff first yeah. and, and bring it to, and that was his, that was the pleasure for him, was yeah. bringing something that he, that he really, really dug, yeah. putting it out there and seeing loads of people yeah. into it, you know. And that strategy worked. I mean, you think of all those John Peel exclusives, all the bands that, in essence, could, uh, whose rise to uh, exposure could be largely, if not completely, attributed to John. Yeah. I mean, that is, I think every, but DJ I mean, out there wishes that they had a legacy such as John Peel in well, terms of, yeah. The, but the industry, um, it was such a, a massive, tragic loss because um, even though he may, you know, as he got older, he would have probably slowed down anyway. But the problem, you know, is that, um, if, you know, these bands now that, that, that are starting up and they're getting these bands together and, and the, the, you know, there was an outlet there. There was a chance to be heard yeah. nationally. Yeah. Not regionally, nationally, yeah. and he'd he'd feature sometimes he'd feature two, four, six, eight bands a week yeah. on in session, two sessions a night, two different bands, <coughs> um, you know sometimes one, but I mean yeah. quite you know he went up to two. Yeah. He started featuring two bands in session yeah. every night, Monday to Thursday, nationally, and that was you know and yeah and a lot of those uh, were you know, have bec become household names, right? But the, you know it doesn't really you know there was a lot of quality stuff that remained underground, at, you know. Um, I mean, one of my favourite records out of Manchester was a, a, a by a, a John Bissett Smith, mm -hmm. who was a member of Spherical Objects, and he had a solo project called Grow Up, and he made an album called The Best Thing, and it's a fantastic album. I love that record so much. And when John Peel got it, he played the whole album oh, really? in one program. Wow! He just said, "That I'm just going to play this." Yeah. He played the whole of the side of the of the record and I'm and I'm pretty sure I couldn't swear to it because it's a long time ago yeah. I'm pretty sure that he turned it over and played side two as well wow, wow. you know that's, that's definitely an endorsement there yeah but who's heard of grow up yeah right so I mean it, you know th he was about music you know um, some of them became household names but a great many of great stuff that he featured you know um, can only be found if you dip into his into his sessions archive you know but um, that's such a great loss to have uh, a band's you know of I've lost that. Nobody else can do that now. Yeah, and people argue, you know, with the internet and things like that, in theory, there are some mechanisms for so-called democratization, ways of getting your, your material out there. Yep. But it's, it's not the same, is it, really? It can't be, can it? Because, I mean, p he, was the, he was the gravitational draw. You listen to John Peel's show for kind because of, you didn't like everything he played. I didn't like everything heard, he played. I, some of the people we've interviewed have been like some of the stuff he played was absolute shit. But I stayed tuned because I, I I wanted to have an open mind. I listened to it and then the next song was really good. And so people were willing to kind of go through the ebb and flow of his musical interest. Yeah, it was yeah. like sometimes you're like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not quite keen on that. He didn't like everything, yeah. but it, that was part of it. Yes, you know, and and. Um, you listen to John. So, I mean, with the internet, you know, you haven't got that central, you know, you might go to YouTube and do start randomly going through, yeah. but you know, you haven't got that like uh, gravitational anchor right. of, that, that brings all that together, a pl you know, uh, a site where, yeah. you know, there are, I'm sure there are some, I'm sure there's, you know, Pitchfork yeah. sites, I'm sure there are and, lots and of sites. Inner Edge Music, uh, the website for go. our interviews, of go. course, the number one source <laughs> of relevant information for music, but, but, but yeah. You know, this was like Radio One, I remember one radio station, right, that played alternative music, yeah. right? Y you know, the problem with the internet is you, it's just so absolutely huge in terms of people trying to compete for attention, yeah. right? W yeah, the BBC was just one, that was the one national radio yeah. station at yeah. the time. Uh, in the beginning, that was the only national ra radio station. Yeah. Well, Mark, one more question, and again, thank you so much for your time. I am a huge fan of the British TV show, The Prisoner. 
and a lot of people have referenced your own interest in The Prisoner and certain references in lyrics and things of that nature. Um, you have, tell us a little bit about when you were a kid, I mean, in the 60s, you were watching that show, how influential was it? Obviously, yeah. I was uh, actually a fan of Danger Man. Okay, the, the, and, and, and there's a real debate about whether Patrick McGowan in Danger Man is the same character or not yeah. in, what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's the same one. Um, and he hinted that it was the same one. That some of the writers, certainly, George Markham, who wrote some of the episodes, he thought it was the same guy. This guy knows who he's talking uh, about. All right. Cool. But, uh, yeah, so I was a big fan of Danger Man. Yeah. So then it was announced that there was going to be a new show. Yeah. Uh, he was doing a new show. And um, I was, like, adamant that I was going to stay up because I was only about seven, I think, six yeah. or seven, seven or eight years old. Yeah. I wanted to watch Danger Man. Uh, in his new show, yeah. and some of them used to let me stay and watch it, and it absolutely f floored me. I mean, it was utterly, utterly brilliant. I mean, children love surrealism anyway. Yeah. Do you know, they, they they go for surrealism in a much more, you know, um, a less compli complicated yeah. way. They don't uh, they don't have to analyze the the, right. the the allegory or the meaning of it. They just so take it in. So you so weren't asking kids or don't ask what's that? What's the rover? What's that bouncing ball? Well, is it is it mechanical? Is it uh, you, no, you didn't ask yeah, that? Yeah. Well, I had a I had a, an irrational balloon phobia oh, when okay. I was a child. I was, I hate, so I won't, we won't watch the red balloon or anything I'd like that either. I'd have to pop them okay. immediately. I couldn't have them near me. Okay. I don't know why. And to see so that balloon smother, the, so smother huge, him. Yeah, a huge yeah. balloon with a mind of, seeming mind of its own yeah, yeah. chasing you around yeah. Uh, yeah. was the most terrifying yeah. image okay. I could have come up with. Okay. Um, so but it was yeah, all these iconic images, but it was more the character. Yeah. I used to emulate him. I used to walk down the school corridors like, yeah. you know, with a moody look. Yeah. And pull the doors open like this. Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah, I tried to, you know, emulate him as much as I could. Yeah. I just loved the fact that, you know, it was so. Uh, I th and and that actually, you know, interestingly enough, when I think about it, influenced the writing, all my writing, because uh, alienation is a central theme of everything. I can see that existential dilemmas, yeah. uh, existence, non-existence. Those it's like the feeling of, of alienation yeah. that you ha that I, ha I always felt for everything around me, Precisely. even family. Everything yeah. just felt completely like alienated from it, and, and he was—he's extremely alienated. He's yeah. like he's in a village with people all around, and yet there's an alienation that permeates yeah, everything. He doesn't know. He doesn't know uh, friend from foe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't. Uh, you, you, it, this, you have the paranoia, yeah. and then you have all these like really he, his vision of, of uh, you know of of a, of, a, of a future where you know you have a cashless economy where you use use cards, not yeah. money. Yeah. Uh, and they can control you from that way, where you're numbered, your individual individuality yeah. is um, stifled or wow. eradicated. Um, all of those themes that you know um, w that I didn't encounter again until I read George Orwell wow, yeah. later on, when I was 14, when I read George Orwell. Yeah. So the prisoner predated that for me. Wow, wow. Do you know all these like uh, these themes of education, mind control, yeah. conformity, conformity, yeah. Uh, yeah. everything that was in it. Yeah, you know. Wow. I'm so excited to Mark, Mark to talk to you about this. Uh, in some respects, more than all the other <laughs> stuff, because I'm a huge prisoner fan. Have you I been mean, to Port Million? I haven't, but I was going to ask you about that. Stay in the villages in a hotel. Wow. Hotel. And you guys, early on with the chameleons, you guys did a couple press photos in Port yeah, Myron, yeah. right? Yes, yes, yeah. that was my idea. With uh, Peter Tilton, wow. we, we we drove down there and did some shot, uh, some shots on the beach. Okay. That okay. you know, with that big beach where the, when the tide goes out and he's running, his eyes are running away where yeah. the balloons yeah. chasing him, yeah. and then we had some in front of the dome. Um, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, man. Well, I'm so excited because so many um, different shows through the years. I, another one I'm a big fan of is David Lynch's Twin Peaks. Very excited. Um, yeah, I'm very excited. We actually have done interviews with some of the cast. We're hopefully going to go to the fest up in Snoqualmie, North Bend, this uh, this next August. I think that's my favorite TV show ever. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, if we interview David Lynch, I'll definitely mention. Maybe you can be involved in the soundtrack. Oh, we got to m uh, meet Angelo Badalamente a couple months ago. He Huge performed fan, downtown. Uh, the Twin Peaks theme and he's beautiful. Just, um, he's a, I've, I think he's a brilliant composer and and yeah. and perfect, perfect uh, a symbiotic kind of relationship with David Lynch in terms of you know what they bring to each other's work is fantastic yeah. and. And Julie Cruz, are you familiar with her? I, I yeah. she is somebody that I we are her. okay. Oh, we, ex we exchanged a couple of messages a while ago, but um, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, because I, I was excited to see that she was touring. 
and um, and she sent me, she was really kind enough to send me like a little response. Um, and I have got a pho- I have got an autograph photograph, but it wasn't me that got it. Okay. A friend of mine, Brian, uh, came to uh, LA and she was performing, and he got it for me because I wasn't I was in England. Okay. But so I have got an autograph photograph. I love her voice. Yeah. We're going to actually tag Julie when we post this online because I'm a huge fan. And Julie, uh, you're out there, uh, my darling. We definitely would love to interview you. You are one of my music idols. And uh, I'm getting a scoop here tonight with Mark talking about how much he enjoyed interacting with you as well. Do you have a special message for Julie? Um, I hope you have a fantastic, fantastic tour. If there's any way that I can make one of your performances, I'm going to do it. Even if I have to walk there with a nail in my shoe, I'll, I'll definitely try and catch it because I think you're fantastic. And actually, Mark, it'll be you and I going to our show, buddy, because okay. we will both be there, okay. brother. Well, so let's shake there. on it. Yeah, you well, well we got it. We got it. Um, well, one last thing, Mark. I just wanted to, um, you know, as a big fan of The Prisoner, this may blow your mind, but a couple years ago, uh, my partner and I went to the San Diego Comic Convention. It was a big, big event. Yeah, big, yeah, Comic Con, of course. 70,000 people there. And being a big Prisoner fan, and at the time, they were trying to bring, basically redo The Prisoner. There was a new version of it. Yeah, yeah. And we won't get into that, but there was some energy around it there was some things so I actually dressed up like Patrick McGowan and right up on screen right now you'll see that so where did you find the Lotus 6 um, I made one. You made one. I made one. Made yes, one yes. Oh, I'll, I'll send you send you a copy of it. So what was really cool, Mark, is we were going around and we actually, um, for lack of a better term, kind of snuck into a press room where at the time um, I think it was AMC, right? Uh, they had uh, Henry Caviezel who played uh, Jesus in The Passion of the Christ. Okay. He was playing number six, and um, Ian Ian McCullough, of course, wonderful Sir Ian McCullough was in that too. Yeah. And so uh, we actually got the opportunity to go into the press room and do interviews as I was dressed up like Patrick McGowan. Yeah. And um, it sounds a little gimmicky, but it was actually, uh, with all due respect, uh, he had just passed, I think, the, the year prior. And so definitely was trying to kind of um, show love for his legacy and all the wonderful things he had done. So I am I think we are uh, brethren in that respect, my I, friend. I, mean, uh, I admired him. I mean, I came to admire him greatly um, as, a, as an actor. I mean, his, I think his performance in Braveheart was absolutely scared me to death. Is yeah. that... You know, I would have been frightened to have been in the presence of that man and of that character. I mean, he just he was just class act from, uh, and and for such a you know to 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 do something so visionary at that stage of his career when, you know, it was you know he was committing a uh, career suicide in a way because he was, you know, he had this thing uh, sorted out the the clean cut secret agent thing, yeah, yeah. and he completely went against that and did something um, utterly brilliant original. Um, just very, very, the very country. raw. He had to leave the country. It was in anger. People who didn't get the, la- you know, the last episode and, and, and didn't get the answer they wanted or whatever, and he, he, he vowed he'd never, he'd never come back. But um, he had to leave the country. I've heard stories about that, and that's why I love. That's why David Lynch, him, that lineage of not giving away the meaning, right. letting the view, and, and I think the same could be said about you and the Chameleons' music, letting the fans interpret it for themselves. Yeah. That uh, Rorschach test, if you will, of meaning. I would have been disappointed if it hadn't have been completely way out. The way it was going, yeah, yeah. I wanted it to get, you know, as a kid, yeah. I wanted it to get weirder yeah. and weirder and weirder. That's what, I loved the weirdness. I loved the weirdness of it, you know. So the last episode was controversial, was just like the last episode of Twin Peaks. Yeah, but um, I mean, you know, it was, it was the 60s, right? And, yeah. you, and there is a certain kind of silliness element of it, a little bit. Dated, obviously. But, I mean, if you take the, the, the judge's speech in that episode... Yeah. And 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 you know, get yourself in the right frame of mind and listen to it. That's very powerful, yeah. the speech of, and, uh, about the you know the establishment's attitude to re- revolt, yeah. and the way that they you know they crystallised it into three youth, you know, the uh, a member of the establishment who's ha- who bites the hand that feeds him, mm-hmm. uncoordinated youth, mm-hmm. you know, and then you know McGowan's kind of st- you know st- strength of individuality, the absolute you know the you know, you can't stamp it out because it's too strong. That, w- and it's a very powerful speech. I used that's what I used in the Sun and the Moon recording. Yeah. I used that speech to start cover version of Elected, yeah. um, and it opens with that with that speech. Yeah. And um, so I mean, I kind of, and even then, I kind of got it. You know, I got it as a kid. I got it, but I, I didn't need to understand it. And I kind of even got the number one thing. You know, yeah. Yeah. you are you, you are your own enemy. We are doing this to ourselves. If we, if we, if we create a society yeah. 
um, and which is the village was a, a microcosm. If we create a society by which we're having our freedom taken away, our individuality closed down, and we always say they, 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 we are doing this to ourselves. We're complicit in that. We are doing it to ourselves. These are human beings that are doing it. We're complicit by allowing them to do it. We're going along with it because it's easy and comfortable or whatever. And we are doing that to ourselves. So that's right. We, you know, we are the... The, the villain, we are the villain, we are the number one, the hidden yeah. mysterious villain. Yeah. It's us. So, I mean, I completely got it. Yeah. That's deep, that's deep. So, do you think that uh, number six ever truly escaped? Because at the end of that episode, you see an indication that the flat, that the same system well, still in existence. No, it was like, the, that, the, micro, the village was a microcosm, yeah. and it went like that, and it went out into the world. It became the world. Okay. It yeah. became the world. He said, this is the world we are constructing around ourselves. Yeah. You got the village, which was an, you know, the allegories of what he was trying to say. Was, yeah. was going, and now it's, 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 it's out. So that's actually it's a out. bad thing. It's gone viral, yes. and now it's a, a, a larger phenomenon. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, you, you, you know you, freedom is an illusion, yeah. to yeah. be quite honest with you. Unless, yeah. you know, well, for most of us, yeah. it's an illusion. Yeah. You know? So uh, you know, when, we go, you know, when he goes back to his apartment, and the yeah. door opens on its own, and yeah. he's got the little waiter there, and all this kind of thing, you know, that's what he's like. You're not, you, you never, it's a relentless battle to keep your individuality and to keep those things in check, you know. Um, all of those those values that he was fighting against yeah. they're in the world. Yeah. And that's, why, that's what I got. That's my take on it. All right. Well, Mark, that's a beautiful way to sum up this interview. I really appreciate all your time. This is one of the most pleasurable interviews I've done in a while. So we wish you all the best out there. Again, fans out there, keep checking out. Mark and all the great things going on, tours, new material. Uh, we'll have the website up on the screen, and uh, we wish you all the best, Thank Mark. And I look forward to you and I going and hanging out with Julie Cruz soon, hopefully. Fantastic. Oh, well, definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs>